Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor Sergi Trikovic. Hello, hello, Professor. How are you doing? I am very well, thank you. And I uh, I'm very glad to be your guest today. Yes, I enjoy your pieces. Pronounce your name properly for us. Yeah. No, and I said pr pronounce your, your name properly for us. Yes, Sergio Trifkovic. Trifkovic with the accent on the first syllable. Okay, I'm just going to call you Professor. So, Professor, uh -huh. I've been reading your articles on Chronicles for a while, and some time ago you published a piece that was just fascinating, titled The Myth of the Atomic Bomb. There are several articles online detailing the atomic bomb and its impacts, but your article, Professor, was particularly interesting. The, the, the atomic bomb. Sergi, did the Japanese really fear the bomb? Yes, they did fear the bomb, but there is a, a substantial difference between fearing a new weapon of unprecedented destructive power and uh, succumbing to uh, its effect with unconditional surrender. So the Japanese uh, we're not completely unaware of uh, uh, the U.S. plan to develop this weapon of devastating power, but uh, uh, the essence, the, the real crux of my article is that it was not uh, the effect of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that forced the Japanese surrender. It was the entry of the Soviet Union into the war. And uh, let's not forget that until August of 1945, uh, the Soviet Union and Japan had a neutrality pact throughout the war. Until that time, Japan had a diplomatic mission in Moscow, and likewise, the Soviets had theirs in Tokyo, which is somewhat surprising and uh, paradoxical, considering the fact that uh, at the same time, uh, Tokyo and Germany were supposed to be close allies. Also, uh, as a result of, of this strange arrangement, uh, US airmen who were forced to land in the Soviet Far East, specifically Vladivostok, after bombing Japan, were actually interned by the Soviets, but then they were quietly allowed to escape via Iran. So they would be taken from Vladivostok all the way to the Soviet-Iranian border, where uh, uh, an ostensible camp would be prepared for them, and then they would be allowed to slip through and thus get away. But to be get back to your question, yes, the Japanese feared uh, the effect of the atomic bomb, but once it happened, once it was detonated, detonated in Hiroshima two days later in Nagasaki, it was not an event of, uh, shall we say, uh, life-altering significance for the Japanese because they had already experienced the firebombing of Tokyo in March 1945, which was in fact more devastating and took more human lives. However, as soon as they heard that the Soviet Union had declared war on Japan and that they were entering uh, Japanese-controlled Manchuria and making mincemeat of the Japanese Kwantung army, that really focused their minds because what they feared was the possibility of the Soviet occupation of Japan. And uh, having read all of the available secondary sources, I haven't worked on the primary ones, I have to admit, it is my considered judgment that the Japanese elite decided that it is preferable to have the US as the occupying power than the Soviet Union, that it was the only chance to preserve the institution of uh, uh, the emperor, and that it was indeed a matter of extreme urgency, because after all, it was uh, 
technically feasible and logistically possible that the Soviets start occupying Japan's mainland islands within a week or two. All right. So this interview will be conducted like a history class. So, pr pr Professor, I'm going to ask another question. Why were the Soviets so feared? Oh, there, uh, first of all, in uh, the summer of 1945, the Red Army was the most powerful military force on Earth. And uh, even though uh, the Western allies made a substantial contribution to the defeat of Nazi Germany, uh, it is a somewhat little known fact in the Western world that overall, 85% of the losses of the Wehrmacht uh, were uh, due to uh, <laughs> the War of Titans on the Eastern Front. And the, only 15% of Germany's dead and wounded members of the armed forces uh, were due to uh, uh, the Western Front or North Africa or the Mediterranean or the Italian Front, i.e. The, uh, the clash with the Western allies. Now, this doesn't count the civilians, of course, because it was the bombing by the Royal Air Force and uh, the US Army Air Force that accounted for the bulk of uh, German civilian casualties, but that's not much to be proud of. So in the summer of 45, having almost single-handedly defeated the Nazis, of course, with very substantial land lease help from, from uh, the United States and with the participation of Western allies uh, after the Normandy landings in June of 1944, uh, uh, the, the Red Army with its 12 million personnel uh, was indeed <laughs> more than uh, enough to crush Japan's Kwantung army in, in Manchuria, which was half a million strong, but which was starved of resources and fresh recruits because of the requirements of other fronts. And also, the Japanese had a somewhat traumatic memory of their encounter with the Russians at Halki Gol uh, uh, in Mongolia in 1939, which was... Uh, uh, one of the reasons why, in the fullness of time, the Japanese grand strategy was oriented towards the Pacific, uh, towards Indochina and the Pacific Islands, and not towards Siberia and the Soviet Far East. So uh, as soon as they heard that Stalin had decided to turn against them, they knew not only that the game was up, but also that far from waiting for an American invasion but that may or may not come in the fall of 45, they had every reason to fear that the Soviets would start landing in, on, from Sakhalin and Vladivostok and Korea, which they were soon, North Korea, which they were soon to overrun, uh, on, on uh, the northern side of, of Hokkaido. And that was a nightmare scenario for the Japanese because they were aware that in that case, the Soviets would impose the sort of political settlement that they were already imposing at that time in Eastern Europe after the Yalta conference, when it became more than obvious that as far as the Red Army advances, thus far, communist satellite regimes will be installed. And Japan had its own uh, teams of Moscow-trained communists ready to be shipped or flown over if uh, the opportunity arose, of which the Japanese elite was well aware. So I think, uh, on balance, even though uh, the atomic bomb undoubtedly was a very traumatic and uh, impressive uh, feat for uh, the Japanese general staff and political uh, leadership, it was really the prospect of Soviet occupation that turned them to the point where they went to the emperor and said, this is it. 
uh, and on the 15th of August, the people of Japan for, for the first time in history heard the voice of their emperor telling them, and they quote from memory, because it's a beautiful art of uh, understatement, uh, the war may not have gone necessarily uh, in, in, in Japan's favor. That was his first sentence. Uh, and uh, uh, by accepting the Potsdam Declaration, uh, the Potsdam Conference, which had only finished two weeks previously, that effectively meant accepting unconditional surrender because the Potsdam Declaration de demanded it. So uh, to round it off, I would say that without the Soviet entry into the war, but with those two nuclear uh, uh, attacks, the United States still would have to contend with a stubborn, uh, die-hard Japanese military elite, which simply was not able to provide a viable answer to the question of what we do with the Red Army and what we do if the Soviets start landing. Uh, all right. And pr Professor, was the atomic bomb necessary? Uh, on balance, I would say that uh, the atomic bomb was not necessary in terms of strategic outcomes, but that it may have been considered necessary at the time by President Truman and his in the circle of advisors. Of course, uh, this raises a huge moral issue because it is obvious that an atomic bomb is a weapon of indiscriminate mass destruction, which uh, primarily kills civilians. Uh, at that time, the, the, nobody having just developed the bomb could even think of small devices that would be tailor-made for military targets. But on the other hand, by the summer of 1945, the world had been inured to immoral and uh, uh, terrorist methods of mutual destruction. The Germans started it with a blitz in the summer of 1940. Actually, no, sorry. They started in September of 1939 by bombing Warsaw. Then they turned Coventry to ashes. Then in the spring of 41, they bombed Belgrade. And then when the table stand, uh, Bomber Harris, the uh, field, uh, uh, the chief air marshal of the British uh, bombing uh, force, uh, openly said that the objective was to turn uh, Germany's cities and primarily working class areas into rubble and to make life so unpleasant for German civilians that their morale would start, start collapsing. Now, what Harris forgot was that during the Blitz, uh, it was uh, in the East End, which was hit hard, and, and in Coventry and Bristol and Newcastle and other cities, that German bombing actually co contributed to the strengthening of the British morale and resolve. So nobody had ever asked Harris, apparently, how come that in 1940, the Luftwaffe wasn't able to break the Brits, but on the other hand, three years later, uh, the Royal Air Force and uh, the USAAF would do that to the Germans. And they did, because, of course, uh, the bombing of Germany destructed, uh, destroyed dozens of cities. And in Hamburg uh, in 43, and in uh, uh, Dresden in February of 1945, we had victims, numbers of victims comparable to atomic bomb attacks, but no, the German morale actually held until the very end, and the failure of strategic bombing was also apparent in the fact that the German military production 
under uh, the Minister of Armaments, Albert Speer, reached its peak in the summer of 1944. So uh, had uh, uh, the, the bombing campaign been successful in turning the tables and winning the war, the war would have been over in 42, 43, because already by 43, the Allies had such massive air superiority, which was only confirmed in the spring of 44, when the Luftwaffe, to all intents and purposes, had ceased to exist. So the atomic bomb was primarily meant to have a psychological effect on the Japanese, but also it was meant to send a message to Stalin in the early phase of what was later to be called the Cold War, that even though he has the biggest military machine in the world in the form of the Red Army, uh, the Americans have a jack up their sleeves called the atomic bomb, which means that uh, that beautiful instrument of Stalin's should not be used to widen and uh, his empire by force because it could be countered by very effective destructive means. And uh, I'm not alone in believing that the use of nuclear weapons in August 45 was not directed only against the Japanese, even though it was certainly meant to impress them, but also to uh, uh, to score political points in geostrategic terms vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Sergi, Sergi, there is a telling piece in, in your article, and I'm going to share it with our guests, sorry, our, our listeners. The ideology of deterrence is not based on empirically verifiable assumptions. And yet in his 1989 classic, The Evolution of Nuclear Strategy, Lawrence Friedman quipped that the emperor deterrence may have no clothes, but he is still emperor. He remains the bedrock of U.S. national security to this day, according to the testimony of David Trachtenberg, then Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy at a House Armed Services Committee hearing on April 1, 2019. Our nuclear deterrent underwrites all U.S. military operations and diplomacy across the globe, he said. It is the backstop and foundation of our national defense. If this is so, God help us. Well, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, <laughs> you see, one of uh, the basic pillars of NATO is that the attack on one is the attack on all. And uh, by expanding NATO into areas that are totally marginal to US national security, the United States has implicitly accepted uh, responsibility, life and death responsibility, which involves the vulnerability of domestic targets in the US to external retaliation for the defense of the borders of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, and others, borders which were drawn arbitrarily by communists and their successors, borders which often bear no relation to the ethnic and uh, uh, geographic, geopolitical uh, realities on the ground, borders which in some cases uh, remain contested uh, and, and uh, will remain so for a long time. And uh, for anyone to believe that if there was a clash somewhere in Eastern Europe involving a NATO member that would prompt the US president, whoever he or she may be, and uh, their national security advisor and uh, Secretary of State and other uh, inner circle members, that it is indeed, indeed worth risking Los Angeles, New York, or Houston for the sake of Riga or Tallinn or Vilnius 
is absurd, just as it's absurd to believe that uh, the promise of the Secretary of State uh, that Kabul is no Saigon uh, should be taken seriously. Uh, on balance, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, deterrence is such a blunt weapon which claims to work because there has been no outright conflict between the two main adversaries in the Cold War, but which has never been truly tested. And I hope it will never be tested because <laughs> deterrence, uh, nuclear deterrence, which rests on the doctrine of mad, mutual assured destruction, is a game of chicken. And in the real world, the world of uh, geopolitics as we've known it for some three millennia of written history, it is absolutely essential to lower uh, the expectations and aspirations to the level of conflict where it, where it can be uh, mediated or uh, resolved without bringing in existential issues of uh, biological survival. So if you look through history, uh, the war between uh, the Persians and the Greeks, the war between Athens and Sparta, the war between Rome and Carthage and so on, uh, they were the ones that are remembered in history because <clears throat> they were truly existential struggles. But in the end, they entailed a settlement which may have been advantageous to one side and disadvantageous to the other, but it did not entail utter destruction and disappearance of one of the parties. One might say that Carthage did disappear as a political factor, but <laughs> the Phoenician settlement in Northern Africa did remain. And likewise, the most stable system in the history of Europe has been that of the balance of power, where you have an external balance, such as Great Britain, and the great powers, uh, Russia, France, uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, to some extent Italy, and the declining Ottoman Empire, uh, working it out in the heart of Europe, <coughs> the Germans trying to impose hegemony, the British imp uh, intervening from the outside, just as they did against Louis XIV in the War of Spanish Succession, just as, as they did uh, against Napoleon. And in the end, the system settles into a new form of stability with multiple actors. I believe that in the fullness of time, the best formula for peace in the world would be multipolar balance of power, where the United States is one among the powers and certainly not the hegemon. And Russia and China and India are uh, maybe Europe, but I don't believe that the European Union will ever have a unified foreign and defense policy. But we are really talking about Russia, China, India, and the United States. In a global uh, game of balancing, in which the declining power, the United States, will give up its pretension to global hegemony, but at the same time, China will be checked by others uh, once America stops being the threat, because then China will be perceived as the rising power, the one that uh, at some point in time might threaten others, both Russia and, and uh, India are possible targets of China's expansion. And uh, I really believe that this kind of quadrilateral balance would be, uh, I of course omitted Japan because to, to a considerable extent, Japan is, is declining power, uh, its aging population and its stagnant economy 
do not make it uh, a viable major player, but it should be put into the equation nevertheless. However, in the aftermath of Afghanistan, it's clear that uh, the, the notion of uh, full spectrum dominance by the United States and uh, the misnamed benevolent global hegemony, that's the term used by neoconservatives, that era is over forever. Nobody will ever take seriously uh, the claim by some US politician, as has been the case in the past, that America is an exceptional nation, light to the world, uh, the leader of the international community, divided internally and so visibly vulnerable externally, America is in need of coming home and uh, uh, redefining its role in the world, but first of all, redefining its own identity. Because for as long as you have neo-Bolsheviks bringing, uh, uh, destroying statues of national heroes and imposing terror of uh, political correctitude uh, on every spoken and written word, that is certainly not a country that can be a, an example to anyone. The Americans must appreciate distinct realm, realms of influence. So for example, the Russians have an interest in Eastern Europe. The Chinese are interested in East Asia, but according to Pew, the rise of China is greatly resented in the region. So probably the Americans should contain China's power in, in, in that part of the world. On average, it appears that East Asians are more supportive of America than the Chinese. I, I think the battle, the battle for supreme, supremacy may be played out in the developing world and America is not as inclined to, to invest in Africa and other places that are being targeted by China. So maybe there's not much of a battle. Well, in my opinion, uh, it is up to those nations that have reason to fear China's expansion. <clears throat> and we are looking at Japan, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, however defined, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and of course, first and foremost, India. It is up to them because for goodness sake, we're looking at a total of 2 billion people. India is 1.4, uh, Vietnam and Japan and Philippines, roughly 100 million each and so on. We're looking at economies, I forgot to mention South Korea, at the, uh, the economies that taken together equal that of China or the United States. Why should the US be the one to bear the burden? Why should the US be the one to <laughs> pull the chestnuts from the fire? Uh, after all, when Japan uh, and, and uh, Korea uh, vied for supremacy over the, uh, the, the surrounding seas in the Middle Ages, they didn't need an external arbiter who decide to decide who would prevail. Uh, likewise, I think that in terms of the balance of power theory, it is far preferable to let the regional actors work out their own alliances in a way that would ensure the observance of, as you, as, as you say, regional uh, uh, interests by uh, denying this notion that we have deterritorialized interests based on ideology. None of these nations want to wave the rainbow flag, which the State Department proudly waved uh, throughout the month of June, including the embassy of Kabul, which sounds grotesque. All of them follow this uh, notion of traditional national interests defined in terms of a uh, nation state uh, in a Hobbesian state of nature where there is no supreme authority that has the monopoly of power. All of this totally denies the 
neoliberal uh, claptrap of uh, US foreign policy propagandists who claim that somehow we share the same values, uh, uh, that America was motivated in Afghanistan by uh, sending girls to school and by ending uh, discrimination. It's, it's absurd. It's, that's not how the real world works. I do agree with you, Sergi. I think Americans should revisit Sir Harold Nicholson, liberal realist in the realm of international politics. I mean, liberal realist. Japan, Japan and, and America both have a different culture and different interests, and the Americans have no business interfering in Russia's backyard. Absolutely. And of course, some elements of the American foreign policy establishment, especially the neoconservatives who uh, were dominant during the Bush era, are rabid Russophobes. And uh, their Russophobia is visceral, it is racist, and it is hysterical. Uh, Rachel Maddow is a good example. These people uh, will never be able to provide a reasoned, rational answer why America needs to be an enemy of Russia. But because they, they hate Russia's guts, they would be prepared to risk America's nuclear destruction in order to harm Russia. They must be stopped. These people are insane and they're bad, as they're both bad and mad. But, but Sergei, are such individuals suffering from cognitive dissonance or delusions? Russia and America are different philosophical constructs. Therefore, many of these academics on the left and even some on the right, they're not particularly fond of Russia. And Russia is America's antithesis. Therefore, if you dislike America, maybe you should support Russia. Even the concept of Christianity differs in both countries. Yes. Well, first of all, uh, I agree that some of the liberals hate Russia because they see it as a bastion of traditional values, of traditional Orthodox Christianity, and of uh, uh, the maintenance of family, uh, the maintenance of clear distinction between genders and uh, the clear definition of social deviance and sexual deviance which has completely disappeared in the United States. Uh, so yes, I accept that it is possible that in the US establishment, there are people who want to grab Russia's uh, natural resources for geopolitical reasons. And there are also people who want to destroy Russia for ideological reasons. But either way, these people uh, must be stopped because Let's face it, it's the biggest country in the world with the biggest arsenal of nuclear weapons in the world. If they think that Russia will uh, endure uh, the continuation of, uh, uh, of a rhetoric that can only be compared to the rhetoric that the Nazis used against the Jews in 1930s, <coughs> that Russia will endure it forever and that minor US satellites in Eastern Europe, such as the three Baltic Republics and Poland and, and Romania, will be able to bait the bear until the bear starts roaring. Well, that is a self-defeating strategy because in the long term, and this is a very important point I want to make, the United States and Russia need to find common ground because they're in the same civilizational danger. At a time when jihad is uh, triumphant again uh, in the graveyard of empires, Afghanistan, and when the like-minded self-starting jihadists all over the world will start looking for new targets now that uh, Allah has looked with sympathy on their project, and for them, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The, the, is, so, you may go ahead. Uh, it is indeed absurd for U.S. policymakers to think of how to direct jihadist en uh, energy against Russia by, uh, and, and this is happening as we are talking. There are uh, geniuses 
in the US foreign policy and security establishment who are saying that now we should uh, actually encourage these jihadists to look back at Chechnya, to start making trouble in Central Asia, in the form of Soviet Central Asia, places like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and uh, to return uh, their attention to Syria. So uh, there is no doubt that there will be more jihadist activity after Kabul. I think that uh, Africa is probably the most vulnerable area right now. But uh, there are also people in, in the United States who want to see some of that wonderful hardware they left behind worth $87 billion used against Russia. Sergi, America may be technologically superior to many countries in the world, including China, but it is a self-imploding em empire because it lacks a, a, an appropriate metapolitical project. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not surprised that people in the Middle East are so confident in their ability to insult the United States. They know why they're fighting. Yeah. You see, it's very difficult for the United States to have a coherent uh, geostrategic doctrine when within the country you have such insoluble and unbridgeable differences uh, which may be compared to the difference between white and red Russians during uh, the Russian Civil War, 1918 to 21, or which may even be compared, no, they're far worse than the difference between the North and the South in 1861-65, because at least both Northerners and Southerners had more or less identical concept of what is the community, what is the family, what is uh, uh, the meaning of motherhood and fatherhood, what is uh, right and what is wrong. They both came from the same European uh, Christian tradition. They had very deep differences about constitutional rights of states to secede, and there were some cultural differences too, but Today's differences in the United States between people who wave rainbow flags on the one hand and people who uphold the Second Amendment and who support Texas abortion restrictions on the other, those differences are way wider because we're looking at two different what the Germans would call Weltanschauungen, world outlooks, uh, two different philosophies of living and uh, of, of being and becoming, which absolutely cannot be resolved by dialogue and tolerance and kumbaya, because they concern the most fundamental aspects of the purpose of human existence. Uh, the difference between leftist, liberal, uh, ever becoming tolerant outlook and that of a traditionalist who seeks to maintain uh, the normal relations between man and woman, father and uh, mother, child and, and, and family and nation ex as ex extended family. That bridge ca cannot be built because the schasm is too deep and the, the uh, focal points of the two are too divergent and incompatible. The left is suffering from internalized self-hatred. So mm. it's highly unlikely that America will ever unite or be able to orchestrate a superior metapolitical project. T technologically, America is not doomed, but philosophically, it is already dead. And morally, too. Uh, you see, it's not only in the field of ideas, but it's in the field of everyday behavior and uh, it, it started with the decline of the moral of, of, of the manners and one may say that it, it's a trivial thing if uh, uh, the, the son uh, 13 year old son comes with his baseball cap turned backwards to the dinner table and refuses to take it off 
25, 30 years ago. And uh, uh, the postmodern chaos that we see today. So what starts as a minor crack in the edifice ends up with its crumbling into dust. Uh, Lilton, I have to say, I'm suffering from allergies and I have reached the point where my voice is getting coarse. And if you want, we can uh, do a sequel. But I think that I, I'm more or less done for today because uh, I'm losing, as I say, voice and my nose is filling up. Oh my God, what a tragedy. <laughs> no, it's not a tragedy. It is a tragedy. Not... I had so many questions to ask. Well, <laughs> let's 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 simply, you know, uh, you edit what we've got, and, uh, and uh, we can we can certainly. I'm I'm more than willing that that we uh, do a sequel or, or or even two. All right, so we can do a sequel then. So I'll just close this link and upload it as a part one. But it was a pleasure to speak to you, Sergey. Sure. And we'll Same talk day. again. All right. Bye. Bye.